So what I want to talk to you guys a little bit about today is where we can use machine learning and data science to make a real difference in terms of where it can do things in exploration. And actually, uh, much like there was some discussion yesterday, uh, if there was a few combined talks, uh, we probably could have um, uh, covered a few things off because there's a few things I'm going to touch with Ariane in particular actually has already run over, so I'll skip over those. But I guess what we want to do is we want to talk about where does machine learning work well at a regional scale, at a camp scale, and at a near mine scale? And, and I guess one of the questions that's recently been asked quite a bit by the industry, and, and there's a really good paper down here which I've linked to, which is how can we move beyond traditional prospectivity mapping to provide concrete value in mining and exploration? And this is something that, that we're grappling with, and, and there's been a lot of good stuff um, shown in this, in this session, talking about where where can we add more value and, and where can we make sure that we can add a difference for explorers um, in, in the Tasmanides and, and then all over. So um, something that's been covered really nicely actually already, um, particularly uh, this morning. So we actually collect a lot of data as an industry, um, but something that's worth noting is often this data isn't collated or isn't in a good enough form, or sorry, not a good enough form, but it's not in a form that is ideal for, for machine learning or uh, advanced data analytics. And so the understanding of, of where ML can provide value and how we need to prepare our data to go actually use machine learning is really important. Um, this is just a, a classic example of, of one of these old things that, that we do a lot of, which is essentially taking data and just reprocessing so it's more appropriate for a particular machine learning task. It doesn't really matter what that task is. But machine learning algorithms um, don't have the wealth of knowledge and the assumed insight that a lot of people do in this room. So when we're thinking about how we think about, um, say, interpreting geophysical texture, if we think about how we think about how we interpret geochemistry and geochronology, machine learning algorithms can't really do that in the same way. So if you go and just put in the data in its raw form, you'll often get some stuff which looks a little bit strange and, and probably something which is a little bit, uh, I guess, unreasonable. Um, so something that, that's, that's very well pointed out to me uh, on a, on a semi-regular basis is that machine learning has been around for a while in the industry and it's been used and abused in, in some ways to maybe go and, and make false promises about this kind of thing. But machine learning isn't a silver bullet and I think it's really good that we don't think of it that way. We should think of this as a, another part of the geoscientist toolkit. So can we actually add more value rather than it being something which is going to solve all of our problems can we target specific problems and actually look to solve those? Um, there's a really nice quote I like here from, from Amazon Web Services, uh, who are very good at these kind of things, um, who talk about like where machine learning works as a, as a general, uh, I guess, guide. And, and there are certain parts of our exploration rubric which, which fit this quite nicely, and there are certain parts which don't. And we should definitely be aware of that when we're, when we're building these kind of things. So, Obviously, at, at different exploration phases, you have different requirements. The, the, the three very broad categories that I'm going to cover today are regional exploration and, and green fields. I'll cover brown fields exploration and then also kind of near mine exploration as well with an example from each. Um, the way that, that we often think about this is that um, there is, you are, you are trying to get different things at different scales. So at really, really large scales, often what you're trying to do is things like cert scale reduction. You're trying to get an idea of, of maybe where you should pick up new tenements, maybe where you should pick up ground, maybe where you should extend your tenements. At, as you get finer and finer, you actually need to start saying, well, not only do I need to start picking up tenements and doing traditional exploration, I need actually drill targets. And, and that's, I guess, the thing that, that we're really big on is how do we move beyond providing this, this big picture understanding, which is, which is really good, to go and say, how do I actually go make a difference in terms of the meters that I'm putting in the ground and deciding what I should do? Um, prospectivity has actually been covered quite nicely today, so I, I don't need to go into this too much, but there's like this knowledge-driven approach or the mineral systems approach, um, which I guess was uh, Cam McQuaig and, and John Ronsky um, and Steve Beresford kind of spoke about in, in 2010 and then Leslie Wyborn um, had obviously kind of broached this in the early 90s, which it's, can we try to quantify um, the combining theories of our mineral formation? And so what, what you normally get for a mineral systems approach is something like this on the right hand side, where we go and say, these are the things we need for our deposit. Can we map those in some kind of form? So can we map distance to granites, if that's something that we're interested in? Can we map distance to faults, all those kind of things? 
And then can we build those and then overlay those together? Um, this is actually really good because it's a really good thought exercise at the very least to actually go through your data and say, does, is there much search space for what I'm looking for? There's also, again, I, I won't go into this, but can we use a hybrid approach which looks at the mineral systems approach, which goes and takes the expertise that's, that's in this room and in other rooms and actually combine that with machine learning because that's where the value is. It's a value of how do we make sure that we're injecting the domain knowledge and the expertise that comes from decades of exploration into these kind of systems. So let's, let's talk about kind of a, a bit of an example of one of these. So um, this is going to be uh, me talking about an area that I'm not super familiar with, so I prefer if no one yelled at me, but tin tungsten deposits in, in northwest Tasmania are typically associated with, with upper parts of Devonian granites um, and where fluids have, uh, from the cooling granites are ponded and or, or concentrated. So what we want to do is we want to go and say, if that's our exploration rubric, then what we want to do is we want to go and say, well, what, what about that can I actually map? What about that do I have in my data? And so we can do things like we can go and say, well, the upper part of the low density granite bodies are going to manifest as gravity lows. So, okay, we can, we can map that. Australia has probably the best pre-competitive data sets in the world. MRT's done some really good work at actually putting all of this data together. There's some new surveys down there. We know that the, um, the low iron titanium oxide of old granites tend to be magnetically quite quiet. Again, we've got really good mag data all over Australia and MRT no, and Tasmania is no exception. And we also know um, that when any of these granites are exposed at surface, we get, we get really strong radiometric signatures. Now, I'm not telling anyone here anything that I don't already know. This is, this is very simple. Um, but what we can do is we can combine all these things and we can, we can use a machine learning approach to go and say, here's uh, what we've got here on the right hand side is we've got uh, all the uh, examples of uh, mineral occurrences that are in this space. And what we can do is we can go and train a model and we can go and identify maybe some areas where there, there hasn't been exploration done previously. And we could go and say, well, okay, what makes these areas interesting? And, and we want to put in things that make sense. We want to put things like distance to granites. We want to put in things like gravity. We want to make sure that all of this is processed and correctly dealt with before it goes into any kind of um, machine learning model. Um, the, I wish I could have stolen um, Catherine's slide from this morning talking about like where most of the effort goes in one of these machine learning models because it's all in the data cleanup in QC. There is a, not a lot of excitement comes actually out of the building the machine learning model. It's all the, uh, the fun stuff you get to do at the front, which is a lot of messing around in Excel. And so what you can do is you can go and say, from a very, very high level, you might go and say, these are the exploration tenements in Northwest Tasmania. If you were interested in um, tin tungsten exploration, you could take all this pre-competitive data and you could probably have a go at saying, all right, let's go find some areas that might not have been potentially um, explored and we could, we could go there. We can pick up some tenements, we can, we can do some further exploration. But, but maybe we can take this a step further. So what if we borrow some stuff from some other industries? So in this case, we've got a, a geophysical image uh, on, on the left-hand side, uh, and we're going to basically focus on one particular feature of interest within this um, particular area. Within this area, we know that when we interpret geophysics, we don't just look at the absolute number of uh, magnetic intensity or gravity. What we do is we look at things like texture. We look at things like the relative uh, values compared to everything else. And so what's quite useful is that if we prepare our data in a particular way, we can use computer vision techniques, and, and I won't go into that uh, because everyone will fall asleep, but generally what you can do is you can go and say, well, what I want is I want not only the machine learning model to care about that dot, because we don't need to just drill bumps. We can do that if we'd like. But what we want to do is we want to be a little bit more intelligent about that. So what we can do is we can go and say, show me every point, uh, and this isn't the entire search space, but, but let's just uh, for a moment think it is, show me every other area which is similar at a large scale. So we don't care just what's happening at a small scale. We don't care about just what's happening at a large scale. We care about the combination of these things. And this is a little bit more how we think about things in terms of if we're interpreting geophysics or if we're doing things in exploration. We don't kind of think of one of these things at once. We combine these things to actually come up with a better interpretation. And so instead of us just going to say, and, and if you've ever had the pleasure of building a machine learning model, the first thing that you'll do is you'll go put in all the high magnetic points and you'll just get the high magnetic points out. And that's awesome, but it's not necessarily something that's super useful for us. So what we can do is we can go and say, well, let's use all these techniques, combine what's happening at the large scale, the medium scale, and the small scale, 
And what we're going to do is we're going to say, actually, as geologists, I know which one of these is more important in this particular deposit type. Maybe the local scale is, is more important, or maybe the large scale is more important. And so this is where these kind of systems can allow you to actually inject the domain expert into them. Because ultimately, if you just go and say the large scale, the medium scale, and the small scale are exactly the same importance, that's actually not true either. We actually need to be able to go and quickly say, well, not only is this point interesting, but it needs to be interesting in terms of the large scale to some degree, the medium scale to some degree, and the small scale to some degree. And, and that's the kind of approach that, that we take towards these things, is we need to be able to inject the domain expert into this system, and I'm going to bang on about that until I'm blue in the face. It's about how do we actually get the knowledge that is in this room and others into these kind of systems. So what if we go to a much smaller scale? So we, we've gone and we've looked at something. What if we're actually looking at a deposit scale, or what if we're looking in the brownfields environment? Normally what you're doing is you're going to have maybe slightly more consistent data on some scale, so your geochemistry might cover, be covered a little bit better. Your geophysics is probably still going to be pretty good. The, again, the, the statewide surveys and, and the GA compilations are brilliant for this kind of things. But you're, you're kind of looking for different things at this stage. You might be looking for things like a near miss. So you might be interested, and, and Dave Cook covered this beautifully yesterday, is you don't necessarily need to know when you're smack bang in the middle of a deposit because the grade in the deposit tends to give that away. What you're interested in is you want to know when you're near something interesting and how do you vector towards that. And that is actually, again, something that can help us do something sensible. So what we're looking at here is unfortunately something that's not in the Tasmanites, but this is an example of, of doing just that. Where what we've got here is we've got a system, and this is just um, a little leapfrog model, and what we've got through the middle here is the ore-bearing unit. So this is their, their main ore-bearing unit uh, of a VMS system. And so when they're in the ore-bearing unit, it is very obvious, again, because it's running grade, um, this is a, a system which is a little bit hard for them to visually tell the difference between. So they don't, it's really hard sometimes when they're logging to actually figure out exactly where they are in the system. So what they, wanted, what they approached us to do is to go and say, well, can you tell us when we're near something? We don't want to know when we're in the middle of a system because we're well aware of that. What we want to know is if I drill a hole in my northern or my southern leases, can you tell me when I'm near something that's interesting? And I want to know why. I don't want to have a black box. What I want to know is you need to tell me why it thinks that point's interesting. So let's, let's talk about why that point might be interesting. And so machine learning models are, are, are a black box and definitely have the reputation of being a black box, but we actually want to kind of get rid of that reputation entirely. This is what we've got here, is we've got a distance to grade shell uh, on the x-axis, and we've got the ordinal importance rank of a particular element that went into this model. In this case, we're going to use lithogeochemistry. But this was actually, and this is actually really good, from, particularly from the talk that, from the Sandfire group yesterday, is you can really go see, for example, there's different elements are driving how far you are away from the ore body, depending on what distance you are away from the ore body. So if we just go look at arsenic, um, for example, up here in the top left, Arsenic, when you're really, really close to the ore body, doesn't, isn't really instructive. It doesn't tell you whether you are right next to your ore body or not. What it does tell you, it tells you if you're in a halo that's several kilometres away. And so that's actually where it's more useful in this particular system. Um, tellurium, we see a little bit of the opposite relationship where it's really important and it's really useful at telling you when you might be hundreds of metres, so in a real near miss situation. But it's actually not super useful at telling you when you're um, really far away from your deposit, so whether you might be within several kilometres of it. And the reason this is kind of good is because if you can start peering into these machine learning models, you can start seeing geological processes. You can actually start to get a feel for which elements are driving that and what do those elements actually mean in terms of is, am I looking at, if you're looking in a porphyry, are you looking in a particular part of the porphyry model? Are you looking in a VMS? Are you actually looking um, at a particular part of the alteration as well? And, and that's something that's really important because if you, again, we're very much not a fan of, of building black box models, but you can actually go and say, I actually understand what this model did, so there I can, therefore I can have some confidence. And, and this model had a, had a very nice near mine success, and it wasn't because it was doing anything overly amazing. What it was doing is it was giving the geologists another way to look at their data. And that's what a lot of this is. It's not designed to replace the geologist, and I certainly hope that's not what you take away from anyone's talks from today. What it's designed to do is hopefully add value to what you're doing and give you another way to assess your data. So what if we go 
to the really near mine exploration. So what if we go, we've gone from the, the brown fields, we've looked at some of the green fields and, and some regional exploration. What if we go to the, the near mine? So we're talking about really, really small scale things that we might be interested in. One of the things that we actually have, which is really interesting for machine learning, but we don't necessarily do a lot in terms of the machine learning space is core photography. Um, I've written a whole bunch of words here and those words are meant to say getting core photography into a state that it can be used for any type of machine learning or intelligent analysis is uh, I would say politely a nightmare and we we employ a lot of machine learning engineers and a lot of other people who are trying to solve this problem try to actually turn the humble core photo which is very useful for our visual interpretation into something that is machine learning ready you need to do things like photo de-warping you need to do things like actually machine learning models are really stupid so what they'll do is if you got a, a, an ori line or something running along the core it will start to think that the most useful thing in determining whether something's interesting is whether the core was oriented which is not actually all that useful from from our point of view so you need to do all these intelligent things but once you get to this point you can start asking really interesting questions of your data you can start asking things like can i figure out my vein area per meter uh, I've had the pleasure of doing this job of logging vein density per meter and it is a fun task and but what we can do really is we can actually go and look at not we can actually turn our geologists from people who are interpreting uh, going to collect this information but going to interpret what this actually means and this is where the real value is because geologists as a general rule are, are fairly smart people and so what we want to do is we want to get away from us having to collect all this data what we can do is we can actually go and say, what does this actually mean for me as an exploration geologist? What does this mean for me as a mine geologist? And, and this is where the real value is. Because uh, what you want to do is you want to go and say, I want to ask intelligent questions of my data. And it, it does take a bit of work, if I'm entirely honest. But once you get to that point, you can start to ask really intelligent questions of your data. You can automatically go build models that might tell you, show me all of, if you've got oriented core, show me all the veins that are dipping in a particular orientation. Show me all the veins that are within the lithology X. You can do all these really intelligent things that will mean that you don't have to do data collection, but you can do data interpretation. You can do any number of intelligent things as well. Um, one of the things that, that we do a lot of and that people are really interested in is the idea of like textural classification. So if we went and took our, our core photo, sorry, our core box, and then we turned it into just a, a rock strip, and then what we did is we cut it up into tiny squares, and we said, there's a texture that I'm really interested in. And this texture, I think, is going to be the thing which I want to see more of this. Can you go show me everywhere across the, the 60,000 meters that I've drilled, do I ever get this texture anywhere else? And what you can do is, this is um, some data from uh, Minex CRC, so some of the drilling that's happened out at East Tennant. Um, what you can do is you can go and put one square in and go and say, show me everything else that looks similar to that. And again, the reason this can be really valuable is often we won't be able to find heaps of examples of a particular thing. We might only be able to find several, we might only be able to find one or two. But what this can do is this can go and say, search through my entire data set to go and find potentially other examples of where I might have this texture. Now, this texture is, is not as interesting, but in this case, what we're seeing is just, if you wanted to go find textures which are a particular um, style or a particular thing, you can go do that. Um, the thing that's worth noting also is you can kind of ignore color in these things. The way that computer vision works is you can say the color doesn't matter, the only the texture does. And that's really good, again, to, to cite Dave, logging by color isn't the greatest thing to do. Um, but what you can do here is you can really go through and go and say, well, actually, it's this texture which is the important thing. What it looks like in terms of its color, so you can actually start to remove some of the biases that we have. And again, very easy things to do. The last slide that I'll finish off on here is you can do some really interesting things where you go and say, well, if I've got all my core photography and I've, I've gone to all this trouble of drilling holes and I've gone to all the expense of, of getting oriented drill core, you can actually start building domains of your drill core. So similar to how you might build geochemical domains, you can start building image textural domains. And what you can do, and I won't go into this because it's, it's not overly exciting, but you can extract all the information about these, these particular things and go and say, go show me the six most abundant groups in my data. Go show me the 10 most interesting things, but they have to have a vein in them or all those kind of things as well. And that's what this is designed to do. It's designed to help us ask questions as, as geoscientists. And how do we get to a point where we can go and say, we can do more with the data that we already have. We don't think 
that we need to do that we need to necessarily be collecting different data sets or that we need to be collecting data in a vastly different way we, we can all maybe depending on who you've got taking your core photos take a pretty good core photo and providing you've got something sensible in it you can actually really start extracting really interesting textual information and this can be really valuable to you because this is data you already have. And this allows you also to go back through existing data sets. If you've got holes that have been drilled near you and you go and re-photograph them and you go want to go see, I've seen this texture in one of my drill holes, can I go see this in any of the state surveys drill holes? I've seen this texture in somewhere that's, uh, that's proximal to one of my deposits. Do I have that texture anywhere else in my deposit or in any of the other data that I have access to? Um, I'll leave it there because I don't want to take up too much of anyone's time. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for your attention.